Welcome to the Growler, a Who Day podcast hosted by Paul Dana and other bald friends like Mo Egger, Dave Nan MS, home of all your Bengals breaks. Takes. Welcome to the Growler. All right, welcome in to the latest edition of the Growler. Balds don't lie, Paul Dana Jr. Hello, bald Mo Egger. What's going Hi. on, Mo? How are we doing? Oh man, things could not be any better. Neither of us have hats on today, so it's a good, it's a good, it's good Monday. It's a good, it's a great Monday. You know, we we never talk about it, but yet we always show up exactly the same. Either hats, two mm-hmm. hats, no hats. It's a little concerning. We've been we've been talking over microphones together for a long time, and I think this is a clue that it's been too long. It's too uh, much. Uh, is are you telling me something here? No, I'm saying this is our last show. Is what I'm saying. Oh, okay. We're never going to do this that's again good. together. We know we're knowing oh, each other a, a little run. too well. It's been a good a run. Problem. It was a good. It was a good run. Well, here's the really sad thing. I'm still making you come on my show. So, <laughs> so really, who wins? That's fair. That's fair. Which we will do. Which we will do uh, yeah. tomorrow on Tuesday, mm-hmm. three to four, ESPN 1530. Make sure you check out that hour and all the rest of Mo's. Uh, content. It's gonna be hard to talk Bengals because the Reds are the Reds are here. They're doing yeah. fun things, so it's like I guess we got we have to squeeze. It's more squeezing the Bengals in right now as as Reds fever has shown up quickly. Well, it's it's the best of both worlds, right? It's a baseball team that matters, that people are excited about, that people have some questions about, but also we're also now starting to just turn to the draft, which is really the fun thing of like yes. the Bengals. You've said this often, they, they now participate in the fun part of the off season, which means we don't start doing hardcore draft stuff on our show in, until really April. And in fact, I was thinking yesterday, like, all right, April one, let's, let's start thinking about who we're going to get on over the next couple of weeks where ha- there have been years where by April 1st, it's like, man, what else can we do? And so, I'm kind of excited to balance draft and baseball and uh, should be a really fun next few weeks. Yeah. It's a, and, and the reds have uh, quickly made it fun in the, mm-hmm. uh, in the, an in absolute instant of a game that looked dead in the water. All of a sudden it's like, Oh, well that's fun. If you can <laughs> count on something like that happening, we'll save that for tomorrow. Cause there's plenty more red okay. stuff too. Mm-hmm. I want to do something really fun here today. We can talk about the Bengals offensive line drafting. Oh boy. Yeah, this is the stuff that gets people <laughs> real excited and happy. We're gonna relitigate some old stuff, but uh, here's here's what I do want to do, Mo, because I I think, look, at a certain point you got to be able to look yourself in the mirror as a person and say, okay, here's my strengths and my weaknesses. Mm-hmm. How can I go forward and best augment my strengths? Okay, and, and that's why we have lots of hats, right? Mm-hmm. We wear hats a lot. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. it's like, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to be anything. I, this is who I am. Okay, I'm a bald man. I, I'm a GM or a team that we don't <laughs> draft offensive linemen well. Is what you sit there and say <laughs> as you look yourself in the mirror. How should I pr- proceed, knowing that this is kind of the history? I have plenty of other strengths. Look at all the strengths. Look at all the receivers. Look at all the great decisions we've made. And some, some of the draft day trades have been really nice. Look at some of the things you've done with, uh, you know, whatever DB, all, whatever. Name all the great strengths. What? The Bengals have not drafted offensive linemen well. What to you does that mean when you – does that make you think about this draft differently where it is squarely in the crosshairs, specifically up in the first round? It it really doesn't for two reasons. Number one, it it feels like this is the perfect marriage of need – and depth of class right now, you know, we could have made the same argument about tight end last year, but the Bengals need a long-term answer at right tackle. Guess what? There's lots of right tackles. And so I think you have a higher, a higher chance of hitting. I also think this, like I've made bad meals before. It it doesn't keep me from going into the kitchen and trying to cook. Like you don't make a bad meal and go, man, I'm never going to cook again. And so because they've not gotten it right before means they shouldn't take an offensive lineman now like that. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, You and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I I think, I I think this pick has to signify 
the the beginning of the Bengals showing an ability. I'm I'm being way too clumsy with the words here. They have to start drafting offensive linemen well because you can't keep going to the free agency well, especially with what the spreadsheet is going to look like moving forward. But I've I've seen some people talk about, well, God, you know what? They don't draft offensive linemen well. So what are they going to do in the draft? Uh, probably take an offensive lineman. Like, should you not take an offensive lineman because you whiffed on Cedric Obwehi nine years ago, or maybe because Jonah Williams didn't quite play like the 11th overall pick. No, they have a need. They need a long-term right tackle. They need some other long-term answers on the offensive line. Do they trust themselves to, to make those picks? I would like to think the answer is yes. Now we as outsiders can be skeptical about their ability to properly identify and develop offensive linemen. And that's fine. But at the same time, you know, if we're sitting here two, three years from now, when it's time for the O-line to turn over again and move on from some of the guys who have made up the line the last couple of years, if it's uh, another couple of years of going, God, you know what? There's nobody they've really drafted that you can trust, and they're going to have to sign a bunch of free agents again. Okay, fine. But uh, I think that's a very perilous approach and one that's not quite as easy given just the financial realities of the team in a few years versus just – uh, two off seasons ago. So that's a long winded answer, but just because they have failed with offensive linemen in the past, doesn't mean you shouldn't take offensive linemen now. Right. I mean, have you gone into the kitchen and made nine consecutive bad meals? Uh, no, no, <laughs> no, but like, I mean, I, you still need to eat, right? I mean, you, you, you got to eat, but there's other options yeah. I can order, right? Like yeah, I, I can sure. use DoorDash. Mm -hmm. Um, I can, do any number of I can maybe someone else will make me a meal, right? Like that's <laughs> if there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about it and say, look, how about you know, like look, my wife is an incredible cook, right? She mm -hmm. makes great food. I'm good at doing the dishes afterwards, and a lot of times that works for us. Uh -huh. You yeah. know what I mean? We we switch, but like she, you know, she's she's we we have admitted where we where we land sometimes where I don't really have that strength the same way. And so the Bengals, I think, have done that in that, okay, well, we'll pay some of these offensive linemen. We'll we'll pay Kappa. We'll pay Karras. We'll pay yeah. Orlando Brown. We'll turn in, we'll have this weird cycling right tackle thing that we do every year. And and that can be the path forward and draft the other spots. The bottom line is here. It, there's no question that this team certainly is more than capable of drafting offensive linemen. Mm -hmm. They should be able to do that. Anybody should be able to do that. The bottom line is you go back and you talk about Cordell Volson, you talk about Jackson Carmen, you talk about Deontay Smith, Jonah Williams, Michael Jordan. I, I'm not gonna hold um I'm, I'm not gonna hold the pre-Zach Taylor mm -hmm. drafts against them. They changed their scouting setup at that point, they brought in a new regime in order to be better at these types of things. And they've had their issues there too. And in, in offensive line, they've gone through all the offensive line coaches. Like they're trying to figure it out. But to me, I, I do think that's something that you've got to, you've got to consider, but I, I do think that is then take, use the highest pick, the, the, the least amount of chance of screwing it up uh, in order to assure that, that you get it right. Or that's how you end up, you know, if you take chances there, that's how you end up in the 2021 situation where you do go from Penn Sewell to Jackson Carmen. And and that but that was that was a choice you're willing to make for Jamar Chase. But that can be the difference. That's a not every year has those two. Dramatic <laughs> to the point. I'm not trying, but that's the concept of like, you know what? Just take the thing when you can get the thing. Yeah. And look, if we're talking about them drafting offensive linemen in round one. I mean, it, they have like, I don't call Jonah Williams a failure. He didn't play like the 11th overall pick, but I mean, he was the best offensive lineman. Granted, this bar isn't very high, but he was the best offensive lineman on a Super Bowl offensive line. He was the guy they proceeded to move forward with in 2021 and 2023. Who knows? They, they might've been in a second consecutive Super Bowl if Jonah Williams is healthy for the AFC championship game. Uh, the second go around against against Kansas City Th that was five years ago, but it's it's not like there's a long list of recent first round offensive line failures, and so to hold against them because they failed when Cedric Oboy he was here in 2005 that was a, a almost a decade ago, a lifetime ago, a completely different regime ago. So, uh, 
do we do we trust them with offensive line drafting offensive linemen? Maybe not. Can I trust them to draft a good offensive lineman in round one this year? The answer isn't no. Uh, time will tell if they get it right. Had they taken Panay Sewell um, instead of uh, Jamar Chase, who knows what the fortunes of the franchise would have been, but I think we would be pretty happy with Panay Sewell, the player. Would we give the Bengals credit for, God, they got it right with Panay Sewell? No, he was this transformative offensive lineman. They didn't make a choice between Panay Sewell and another offensive lineman. They made a choice between Panay Sewell and Jamar Chase. They would have gotten limited credit, I guess, for making the right decision there, but Again, the guy was there to take. And so why can't something similar happen with 18 overall when the class is this deep of right tackles? And if you're if you're balking on the idea of them getting better at that position because of something they did nine years ago, I don't I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair. And I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that they can nail it in round one if you believe everybody who says this is a great historically good class of of right tackles uh yeah. so yeah i but don't hold don't board. hold billy price don't hold billy price and cedric of over zach taylor right and and mike potts's head right like that's that's mm-hmm. not that's not as fair now duke tobin was there the same set and there's a lot of the things but it's it's just such a different setup and i do believe that they have recognized ways that they have failed at drafting and developing offensive linemen in the past and have always shown a willingness or a an ability to learn from their own mistakes it's there's not a stubborn nature to this group and it's part Mm -hmm. of what has made them pretty versatile coaches as seasons have gone along and as they've progressed from year to year and so and i think they recognize ways that they have gotten more out of cordell volson than jackson carmen and deontay smith and michael jordan and some of those others and they admitted it at the time. Like they felt like he was a guy that had all the right makeup that they wanted as far as the, the, the way that he played. And he maybe didn't have all the physical stuff. You'd love to have both, but I think they learned to make that priority one in getting the most because, because what offensively on the offensive line, what serviceability, right? Uh-huh. No yeah. major disasters out there. And, that usually lends itself to the guy with the high floor uh, or at least the ability to get the most out of his talent for sure that you can, that you can bank on. And that could be anybody. There's a number of guys in this draft that you could say that is you've got to have a willingness to do that, but they've really only had one first round offensive lineman that they, this group has picked. That's Jonah Williams. He was their mm-hmm. first pick and you can look back at that. And I don't have a major qualm with if that was the position they wanted to take. It was fine. Like that was a fine okay serviceable pick i think Mm -hmm. the problem comes when you look at who was on the board and went next it's like when you take jonah williams and behind him here's this the next six of the next eight players selected the year of the jonah williams (laughs) pick are currently making at least 22 million dollars per year Uh uh-huh that is Edge number eighth highest paid edge Rashawn Gary. That is third now highest paid defensive tackle Christian Wilkins. That's the the top paid right guard Chris Lindstrom. Brian Burns now the second highest paid edge at twenty eight million. Dexter Lawrence the eighth highest paid defensive tackle, and Jeffrey Simmons who is vastly underpaid at twenty three and a half million dollars per season. When those are available. Right. It's like when to pick them, when not to pick them. And, and, and you so it's it's like when you, I have no problem with the Jonah Williams pick on its face. But then you're like, oh, but one of those sure would have been nice. And that and that's part of where the problem and the evaluation comes in, too. Yeah. At the same time, <clears throat> you know, there were those of us that year who were lobbying for them to draft. God rest his soul. Dwayne Haskins. Yeah. Uh, and it it just, you know, it just didn't work out. Um uh, but by the way, I th- I think you could look even lower in the draft and go, man, somebody should have reached for Debo Samuel, my my favorite player <laughs> in the NFL, who doesn't play for the Bengals. So I mean, it but it, it could have gone either way. I, I as somebody, <clears throat> I even think I I wrote at the time like, go draft Dwayne Haskins. Well, okay, uh, Jonah Williams ended up being a better football player than Dwayne was, and it, it's it's terribly sad that obviously we didn't get a chance to see what the future chapters of, of Dwayne Haskins uh, football life and, and just life in general would have, how those things would have played out. But 
you're right. It could have gone in the direction of guys. Montez Sweat is down there. There are others who have been very good players in this league, but where they could have gotten it wrong. And had they taken a quarterback in 2019, like many of us said they should, are they taking Joe Burrow in 2020? So you could go either way with that. I guess I view Jonah Williams as did, did he play to the level of, I, I, I think I've made this comparison before. Drew Sample's a good NFL player who does this one thing really well. Has he ever played like a, a second round choice? No, especially not how we think about tight end usage in this league. But is he a good player and a guy that I'm glad that they've brought back? Sure. So you get to a point where you stop holding against a player where he was taken and even some of the other guys they could have taken. In any draft, there are there are players you decide not to take and you understand they might end up being really good. Pene Sewell is one of them. So um, does the guy give you something close to what you're looking for during the time he's a Bengal? With Jonah Williams, the answer is yes-ish, and it's only yes-ish because he missed his first season with an injury and he got hurt his second year. Uh, if if they take a player like Jonah Williams with the 18th overall pick, regardless of who else they could have taken, would, would most of us be okay with that? I would think so. I yeah. Would think, I, you know, yes, yes. Not every first yeah. round pick is going to be a star. Not every first round pick is going to be a Pro Bowl caliber player. If they draft the equivalent of Jonah Williams – and, and play him under a rookie contract for the next four years, and he plays like Jonah Williams did when he was at his best, are we going to be okay with that? I'll be okay with that. I'll, yeah, I'll be more be, than okay because, with that. Because the alternative is disastrous, okay? Right. I, if yeah. you again end up down the Abwehi, Price, Carmen, Hole, and and because those guy, that guy's going to play, and if he's not good, you are jeopardizing your franchise, you're jeopardizing the health of your quarterback mm-hmm. and everything else. It's just, it's so important. And that's why I, I like their setup now that that guy does not have to play right away. They have time for him to gain experience in low leverage, non burrow possible injury situations mm-hmm. and really get a feel for what he looks like when it, when it kind of is going and that, whether that's the preseason or whether that's time sitting on the bench or extra time working with him in the season, whatever that is. That's that's valuable to me because that you just you get nervous that you're going to end up seeing that again. And I go through the image of Cedric Abway. He's stepping over top of Andy Dalton <laughs> when another player was had just sacked him because he couldn't block him and Cedric wouldn't even help him up. And it's like that's what what you can't do. OK, is go down that road again. Right. And, they, they've got to be better in that way in nailing this evaluation. It's, if that is the way they go, it's just such a critical pick. They're lucky that this year there are going to be sure bets there at 18, which there aren't normally when you're talking about that position. Um, and for that fact, you know, the history to me, the answer to that original question is that the history says, you really need to be going offensive tackle here for anything outside of really defensive tackle, probably just because of how hard it is to find a real player at that position as well. Yeah. And and remember with John Williams, it was sort of the opposite, right? They announced he was going to be the starting left tackle before he even went to OTAs. Mm-hmm. Well, they don't have to do that now. Uh, and he was really put behind the eight ball because he didn't play his rookie season. His first NFL game was Joe Burrow's first NFL game. Uh, they had to throw him to the Wolves in that game against the Chargers because of the weird COVID offseason, and he didn't play his what was supposed to be his rookie year. So, you know, knock on wood, ideally, it's you're not going to have those circumstances. He is going to be in a situation where he's going to be surrounded by offensive linemen who have gotten it done in this league. If, if ever there's been a better situation for a first-round offensive lineman to walk into than to be surrounded with guys who have had success in this league before, I'd like to see it. So I don't hold their history against them in, in this regard. It's, it's, it's not fair to do. And and even if you want to hold their history against them, are you going to tell me they still should like, you may not trust them, but okay. There's a difference between what you trust and what they should and shouldn't do. Should they should again, should they not draft an offensive lineman early, including with the 18th overall pick just because they've screwed it up before that, that doesn't, that, that logic, if, if you are nodding along, that logic to me doesn't make any sense. No, and, and the other side is we'll just keep paying guys that, that are a little more put. That's That gets expensive, and you'll never get a great 
player that way because the the truly top high end offensive linemen just so rarely hit the market and there would be a point where you'd have to vastly overpay if you ever want to have somebody who's a little bit more of a real dude there that's the only way you're going to get them is if you can eventually get this right um and and maybe this is maybe this is the year that they do it certainly it, it certainly falls in line I wonder, you know, the thing that's, that's said a lot and people point out a lot is the fact that they have not drafted uh, these highly athletic players. Um, mm-hmm. You know, people ho- putting all the 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 how they have the outlier in the relative athletic scores of all of these guys. And a lot of that is partially I mean, Orlando Browns is a crazy <laughs> outlier, um, things like that. But Orlando Brown said, hey, look. Uh, I I was slow and not good, but you, I, you just got to know how to go out there and do it. That's that's the vast majority of the battle. It's 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 knowing how to go out there and play the position. And now that Trent Brown's not going to help those numbers either. And, but that's now we know they're leaning into that way. Mm-hmm. Is that going to be the risk of the play that they're going to do again? You know, and and that's the question: is is if it's a guy who was one of these bigger, powerful guys? Now there's a lot of good athletes, but they've got to get that. They've got to get that part right there, or you can say, oh, they're just going down that road again. Here mm-hmm. they go down the big, powerful, lumbering, non-athletic offensive line road, and that's what's gotten them in trouble here in the past. And maybe that ends up being the case, but I think that's that's something that they'll have to sift through and consider no matter where they pick. Yeah, and, and I think you made a, a really important point there. I mean, the, the Bengals have – they've spent – to their credit, good money on their offensive line. It was a below league average offensive line last year, according to Pro Football Focus. And so really, if you want the ceiling to be high, if you want to develop an offensive line that is truly among the league's best, you're going to need to draft more than one guy. But that's that's really only going to come through mainly having a group of guys that you have drafted and then maybe filling a hole with the free agent. So, yeah, I mean, you and I talked about this two, three weeks ago. It's... It's commendable what they did post-2021, looking at that offensive line and saying, great, we nearly won a title with it, but we got to move on, and they've gotten better. But but now they're going to have to start nailing it, and there's no better time to nail it than when you have a class like this of tackles at a position that you obviously have to address here very soon. So I'm 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 actually pretty optimistic that they're going to get this right, Assuming they take an offensive line early, uh, an offensive lineman early, I am I am bullish on the idea that they're going to get this right. And then we can start to talk about in the second half of the decade how they stack young offensive linemen on top of each other and can eventually build a, a really, really good group organically through the draft and then fill in holes via free agency. I don't think the model that we saw two off seasons ago is one that can be repeated all that often. No. So it's safe to say you would go chase over Sewell again, correct? I would go ch- chase over Sewell. Like I-, I view, I view almost any decision through the 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 lens of can I understand the thinking, right? Can can I understand the thinking that went into the decision, even if the decision doesn't yield the results we're all looking for? The, the thinking then was we want explosiveness. Jamar Chase can give us explosiveness. That's that what that's what what wins in this league we're winning on the outside we're building the offense on the outside looking in and then we'll figure out the offensive line later and and by the way it's worked i mean it it, it it's it's worked and and there was always the acknowledgement that panay Sewell might be an elite player every evaluation said he had that possibility you knew what you were turning down they have gotten exactly what they were looking for from jamar chase and the thinking three years ago made as much sense today uh, makes as much sense today as it did in in April of 2021. And my point would be, I don't care if Panay Sewell ends up in the Hall of Fame. Like, they're not going to the Super Bowl in 2021 if they don't take right. Jamar Chase, and nobody's giving that back, okay? Right. That was the right decision at the end of that year, full stop, okay? So they were not going to fully relitigate it. That doesn't mean that the other, that in the long run, that it couldn't have, it couldn't still work out where you would go back and, ch- and trade. Say, you know, you'd rather have uh, Penae Sewell and Nico Collins versus oh, right. Jamar Chase and Jackson Carmen, right? I mm-hmm. mean, and, and there's a lot of other dynamics to that trade that we don't need to get into. But you know, there's there are certain aspects to all of it of when you do push it back and you're trying to find the receiver later. Now it's it's a little different thing where getting the offensive lineman is just harder to do. And that kind of goes back to our original 
discussion. We don't need to belabor that point. Unless you have one more, unless you have a new addition. Refresh my memory on Jackson Carmen. I should know. Did they did they trade down twice in the so second he, round? In the, he was third. They had the thirty eighth overall pick. They uh-huh. traded back to forty six with New England. New England took okay. Christian Barmore, whom you might note is very yeah. good. Yeah. And um, then on the board as well at forty six was uh, Aaron Banks, who went two late two picks later to San Francisco and has been starting for them uh, at guard. Uh, Creed Humphrey, who notably went to Kansas City at 63 towards the end of that round. Uh, and of course, you can do that with any draft, but particularly those were the sure. positions they were looking at. They were looking at interior offensive linemen. Those guys were there. They went with Carmen. They whiffed and they paid for it and trade back and gave up the ability to take Barmore. Landon Dickerson went one spot in front of them at 37. Yeah who is now one of the highest paid guards uh, in, in football. So so the issue isn't that they took Jackson Carmen. It's that they maneuvered to take Jackson Carmen. Right. Well, I, exactly. They knew because they knew they could move back because no one was looking for him at that spot. And so they right. they added picks to get. So like a guy this go around, let's not overthink it and just take the best damn player at that position. Right. Let's just that, let's not get cute. Let's just need a player at this position. Here's a player at this position. Let's let's take him. Or they can just keep signing solid veterans for $4.8 million every year, apparently, sure. which is where it's going right now. Not one of those guys has finished the season, and I would venture to say today, I hope this is not the case for his sake, but his history suggests that Trent Brown's not going to complete this season mm-hmm. because that's not part of his history, and you just hope at that point you have picked the right guy to come in his place. Uh, all right, I think we officially took people down to a dark enough place, but we tried to bring them back up. You know, it's like, yeah. Some things have been bad, but you're on the optimistic side. So you know what? That's when you know it's not as bad as you think. When I'm the optimist, we really need to look around the room and wonder what's wrong with everybody else or what's wrong with me. I don't don't even know what that means. I think you're still on an opening day high right now. You're still feeling it. The the opening day weekend, you know, you're just – it's the Reds are back. Things are good, which which brings – Brings me to something else. The opening day mm-hmm. being a holiday in Cincinnati, like mm-hmm. we all know this is something like this just needs to be a thing here. Okay. It, not opening day, actually. I would just would say the day after opening day probably should be a holiday where no one has yes. to work. I'd, I'd go yes. for that. Um, but I thought it was great. It's April Fool's Day today. And that's mm-hmm. one of those days that it's just kind of tough one to take because everyone's yes. trying to play the trick. Everyone's trying to do something and you got to be – RG3 had a great tweet. You retweeted it. <laughs> I, I got it right here on my phone. Yeah. I was going to read, read me it. R, read me RG3's tweet. When RG3 is the voice of reason, we're really in trouble. So he <laughs> tweeted out, April Fool's Day is the day people critically evaluate everything they read on the internet before accepting it as the truth. Funny, because that should be an everyday thing. RG3, chef's kiss. Thank yes. you. It is truly... We as a society globally have flipped it. Okay. (laughs) One day a year, it should be accept the internet as fully truthful. And then the, all the other days should be like April fool's day currently is a wait. Who said that? Is that even the real guy? Is there any real truth to that? Right. That if, if that was the case, we'd be so much better off. Yeah. I mean, on almost a daily basis, I will see something on the internet that I go, boy, that would be really great on April the Fool's. And it's like, you know, uh, <laughs> September the 3rd. Yes. So, yeah, I, 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 I think the, the climate that we are all living in right now has sort of watered down April Fool's Day. Yes. Uh, would you, it, it, and it makes it really hard. Was there, is there a uh, holiday or sort of a, a general day that is observed? that you that is worse than this like there's for stuff stuff that ends up happening and it's like oh this day you know why do we do this is there another hmm. one i'd say <clears throat> i mean i would point out i don't know if this counts yeah i would point out tax day for the like <laughs> for the like oh did you get it in? did you get did you get your taxes in in time you're up against it get your reef like i just feel like that's that one's annoying just because everybody says the same thing, you know, and like most people don't even think about it that way. Mm-hmm. But so, man, that would be one for me that would stand out. Black Friday. Yeah. Because I always wonder how many of those people are buying stuff for other people. Mm-hmm. So many years ago, 
and I'm going to call them out. Many years ago, I was on a UC football road trip, and this was one of those years where they they decided we're going to have roomies on the road which as an adult, I'm opposed to. I'm an adult man. I want to be in my own room. But anyway, so my roomie, Tony Pike, the game is going to be on Black Friday. So we had to spend Thanksgiving in Tulsa. My guy gets out of bed four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, gets in an Uber and he goes shopping and he comes back and I'm still sleeping. And I finally wake up and he's got bags of stuff. And I go, I got all your Christmas shopping done. He's like, no, man, this stuff's for me. How many of these people on Black Friday are buying anything for other people? That's what I want to know. The Black Friday sales event. I just, and and the internet has changed this, but I'm I'm old enough to remember when there was a day and time where I knew people who were going to go out to the mall at four o'clock in the morning and like drink Bloody Marys. Like, what, what are we, what are we doing? Black, I've never gone Black Friday shopping. I never will go Black Friday shopping. If you are buying something for somebody and standing in line, for hours on end are you really concerned that that person's not going to love you as much if you don't stand in line and buy this thing for them so black friday for me is maybe the single most annoying day on the north american calendar of significant days i i participated one time and it was i was i was living on my own like you know down in i think it was like arkansas i think it was my arkansas one and i was living down there and it was a black friday at like walmart and I needed a new TV. I was like fresh out of school. I'm trying to like make my bachelor pad have, you know, the one thing that has to be good in it. And so I was like, hey, Black Friday, I'll go down there. And I ended up buying a TV bigger than my car. Like, and so I couldn't, <laughs> like, I didn't anticipate like being like, you know what? You got me. Okay. I didn't anticipate mm-hmm. that happening. And I got there. I'm like, this thing literally doesn't even fit into my car. And I had to find some way, call somebody that had a bigger car to get my TV back. And I was like, you know what? This is just kind of the universe telling me, don't do this. Like, this was a mistake in the first place. There's no reason you'd be down here doing this, but that was a nice TV. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it was. First of all, I just don't like getting up early. I don't like, and I'm not getting up early on a day off to go to go stand in, in line. So I'm I'm basically diametrically opposed to Fair. any any sort of Black Friday. Uh, April Fool's isn't great, but but again, the the internet has kind of changed things on on April the Fools. Uh, April the Fools. yeah, April the Fools. I called it. April yeah, the Fools. It's been a day, Paul. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of other. That's I, a good I mean, I mean, I would say I would say I enjoy Groundhog Day solely for hmm. the fact that I do watch the movie Groundhog Day every yes. year, and that's one of my favorites. But the actual act of like. Dude, the groundhog sees shadow, and you gotta like think yeah. that that pretty unbearable. And it's similar in the April Fool's way, and that is just just annoying. But that that would be those would be my two that I would probably throw. So out. in in Groundhog Day, obviously, uh, Bill Murray's character wakes up every morning to the same Sonny and Cher song. I got mm-hmm. you, babe. Right. So in in one of my early years in radio, I was producing for uh, Jim Scott, and it was Groundhog Day, and I decided at the bottom of top or bottom of every hour to come out of the news by playing that song as sort of a, uh, a a homage to the movie groundhog day. And uh, so our show ends at nine o'clock and our boss at the time was uh, a gentleman by the name of Daryl parks, terrific program director. But I, I, we get done with the show and I pass by his office and he goes, Hey Mo, he goes, I got you babe. And I just kind of looked at him and (laughs) chuckled and he's like, not in the demo. And I just like looked at him and then he goes, and you played it every half hour. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, man, you know, you either got it or you didn't. And, and I guess, I guess you didn't. So, uh, there's my groundhog day story. There it is. We actually, yeah. uh, we have a, so- a song that kind of like comes on over our speakers in the room for the, to wake the kids up at the same time every morning. And, mm-hmm. and my wife likes to shake it up. And depending on what the day is, or the holiday, whatever, like she did that this year. Did I got you, babe? got a legit like early morning deep laugh like that i couldn't stop laughing to when it happened i was like that's great and i really enjoyed that my kids like obviously didn't know it and really disliked the song made it even funnier and so it was uh it was a good way to get my day started i this we we ran into this this year so i have always loved as an adult i have loved saint patrick's day it's an adult holiday 
I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, you might put some green on to go to school. St. Patrick's Day was like, all right, the adults are going to have their fun. We get Halloween and Christmas and Easter and birthdays. Kids get every other holiday. The adults are going to go have fun on St. Patrick's Day. So as an adult, this has always been my day, right? And then, you know, even having a kid, all right, kiddo, you could put on a green shirt, but the adults, this is the day we get to enjoy not, not anymore. I didn't know this was a thing. Maybe you did. So my daughter comes home from uh, the neighbor's house and she's got a, a shoe box that looks like you would put uh, Valentine's in. Right. But no, it was this green painted shoe box with uh, shamrocks. And she goes, well, we're going to catch a, a leprechaun in here. And I thought, well, that, that's that's kind of cool. No, no, no. That's not what it's for. It's there to put candy in like an Easter basket, which was only like two weeks later. So now on St. Patrick's Day, if you have children, I suppose there's this expectation that they now get candy. Yeah. No, no, no. There's one holiday that's for adults. One, it's St. Patrick's Day. So my wife and I had this discussion. She's like, crap, now I got to go out to the store. I got to get candy. And I'm like, well, Easter is still a few weeks. But she's like, no, for St. Patrick's Day. Like, can we can we put our feet down? Can we say no this one time? I, of course, got shouted down. We woke up the next day on St. Patrick's Day. My kid had all sorts of candy. I am diametrically opposed to the commandeering of St. Patrick's Day by children in this country. Can adults have one day? One. No. Just no. one day that I, I don't have... have to dress up, buy something, <laughs> fill a stocking, go on a hunt. One damn day. <laughs> Apparently, the answer is no. And not only that, it again forces us to explain why we are letting these creepy creatures into our house. So these le we're letting, we are, we are yes. trying to bring a leprechaun. We are trying to trap a leprechaun inside of our house as if it's like i don't know how to explain about what's happening with the easter bunny coming into my house i don't you've seen these things he's got i don't want these things in my house i don't want that in my house i don't want, you know i don't I'm, I'm already still kind of uncomfortable about santa coming down the chimney but i get it okay yeah and it's like all of these things we're in we're always inviting things into our houses and we're having them throw candy they, they, they don't just get candy they throw it everywhere and make a mess out of it it's supposed to be the gist of it which is even more ridiculous i don't want to have to the tooth fairies coming into my house no one really oh, understands yeah. why we're letting all these things into our house i think there needs to be a new rule that we try to sit down with children like look we're not allowing anything else to come into our house everything is on the front porch i don't want to set a tone that you believe that that's the thing and the leprechaun trap is what has set me over the edge. I was okay with everything else. The leprechaun trap was too much. And I don't like these little leprechaun goblins coming into my house and throwing, you know, green, making the toilet water green. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And you mentioned the tooth fairy. Now, I know that inflation has taken its toll on the American economy. When I was a young child in the 80s, I would lose a tooth and the tooth fairy would leave a quarter. So my daughter is uh, soon to, to turn seven. She has lost two teeth. She has friends who have lost teeth. The, the tooth fairy has dropped off $20 bills. Like, first of all, no. what, what, what? No. And, and, and I'm, I, well, no, that's for the first tooth. Well, then what for every subsequent tooth is five? Like, what are we? I think there needs to be a flat rule for the tooth fairy. We're leaving a dollar a tooth. No more, no less. Doesn't matter if we're in a bull market, a bear market, recession, <laughs> depression, if, if things are going great. But I, I had a conversation with my daughter's friend's dad, and he's like, yeah, the tooth fairy dropped off a, a $20 bill. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you guys live like two minutes from us. <laughs> two, two minutes. The, the tooth fairy's not dropping off $20 bills at, at our house, I don't think. So I think there needs to be a universal standard that the tooth fairy just sort of announces and we all go, yes, that's what the tooth fairy is going to leave. And it should be 50 cents, a dollar for the first tooth, 50 cents for every subsequent tooth. Uh, we'll see if we can get that done. Yeah. Tooth fairy contract. I think yeah. is something you should be able to print out and have the kids sign it that I agree that for all of my teeth, I will end up with a total of $32 or whatever it ends yeah. up being. Uh, all right. Mo, this was we redid a lot here, didn't we? <laughs> we went a productive day. Yes. We covered we covered a lot of ground. I appreciate your time and uh, hanging with me. So uh, I will see you uh, tomorrow on ESPN fifteen thirty from three to four. It'll be great. Looking forward to it, Paul. Thank you. Later.